Okay, so in the conclusion of the last lecture, we wrapped up discussing mean bond enthalpies, where because we don't have every ability to categorize every possible combination of bond breakage, we can model specific examples of changes to bond enthalpies by using analogs or model compounds and because we have a ability to establish mean bond enthalpies for a suite of similarly structured bonds uh, we can use these as an approximation now let's do an example of what this looks like in terms of problem solving so using mean bond enthalpies estimate the standard enthalpy change for the following reaction carbon solid in the graphite form plus two hydrogen gas molecules plus one half of an oxygen gas molecule can react to form liquid methanol in which liquid methanol is formed from its elements at 25 degrees celsius use the information from the data section and bond enthalpy table data uh, tables 3.4 and 3.5 which we just looked at in the previous slides but i'll scan up uh, to start here to solve this problem. So, let me see here. We have table 3.4 where we have our selected bond enthalpies, which you can reference. And we have our mean bond enthalpies, which you can reference. So, strategy. In calculations of this kind, the procedure is to break the overall process down into a sequence of steps such that their sum is the chemical equation required. Always ensure, when using bond enthalpies, that all the species are in the gas phase. That may mean including the appropriate enthalpies of vaporization or sublimation as well. One approach is to atomize all the reactants and then to build the products from the atoms so produced. When explicit bond enthalpies are available, that is, data are given in the tables available, use them. Otherwise, use mean bond enthalpies to obtain estimates. It is often helpful to display the enthalpy changes diagrammatically. So the solution for this would look as, like the following. Um, and it's diagrammed in figure 3.5 right over in the bottom right corner here. So the atomization of graphite going from solid graphite carbon to carbon in the gaseous state requires 716.68 kilojoules per mole. The dissociation of two moles of hydrogen gas requires 871.88 kilojoules for the two moles. The dissociation of one half of an oxygen gas molecule to molecular oxygen gas requires a positive 249.17 kilojoules for the half mole of oxygen gas. And so overall, so far, we are looking at 1,837.73 kilojoules for the defined process. These values are accurate. Now in the second step, three carbon-hydrogen bonds, one carbon-oxygen bond, and one oxygen-hydrogen bond are formed, and we estimate their enthalpies from mean values. The standard enthalpy change for bond formation, the reverse of dissociation, is the negative of the mean bond enthalpy, which we can see in table 3.5. So the formation of three carbon-hydrogen bonds will be negative 1,236 kilojoules. The formation of one carbon-oxygen bond is negative 360 kilojoules. And the formation of one oxygen-hydrogen bond is negative 463 kilojoules. So overall, for this step, going from gaseous carbon, gaseous hydrogen, and gaseous oxygen to methanol, we would see a net negative 2,000 and 59 kilojoules estimated by mean bond enthalpies. Now these values are estimates. The final stage of the reaction is the condensation of the methanol vapor 
because we are looking at methanol liquid as our product. So to go from methanol gas to methanol liquid costs negative 38 kilojoules per mole. The sum of the enthalpy change is therefore delta H equals 1,837.73 kilojoules plus a negative 2,059 kilojoules plus a negative 38 kilojoules for a net negative 259 kilojoules. The experimental value, if you actually do this experimentally, is two, negative 239 kilojoules. So the estimate's not perfect, but it gets you in the ballpark. Chemical change, small slide. In the remainder of this chapter, we're going to concentrate on enthalpy changes accompanying chemical reactions, such as the hydrogenation of ethane, which we see below here. The value of delta H given here signifies that the enthalpy of the system decreases by 137 kilojoules because delta is final minus initial. So if you have a delta H for a chemical reaction, it signifies the enthalpy of the system is decreasing. And if the reaction takes place at constant pressure, that 137 kilojoules of energy is released by heating the surroundings. When one mole of ethane at one bar combines with one mole of hydrogen gas at one bar to give one mole of CH3, CH3, or ethane. Oh, excuse me, no, that's at one bar at 25 degrees Celsius. So let's look at enthalpies of combustion. One commonly encountered reaction, which is well documented, is combustion. The complete reaction of a compound, most commonly an organic compound, with oxygen as in the combustion of methane in a natural gas flame. So in this case, we have methane plus two oxygen gas molecules react completely to form carbon dioxide plus two water. And this is your classic combustion reaction where you have a carbon-based compound where you have carbon and hydrogen and oxygen combusting to form carbon dioxide, which is carbon in its most oxidized state plus water. And the delta H for this process is one, negative 890 kilojoules per mole of methane. By convention, combustion of an organic compound results in the formation of carbon dioxide gas, liquid water, and if the compound happens to contain nitrogen, nitrogen gas. The standard enthalpy of combustion, delta CH, is the standard enthalpy per mole of combustible substance. In this example, we would write delta CH of methane gas is negative 890 kilojoules per mole. Some typical values are given for this over on the side in table 3.6. Note that the standard enthalpy of combustion is a molar quantity and is obtained from the value of delta H divided by the amount of organic reactant consumed, in this case, one mole of methane. We see in box 3.1 which we'll cut to in just a second, that the enthalpy of combustion is a useful measure for the efficiency of fuels. Enthalpies of combustion are commonly measured by using bomb calorimetry, a device in which energy is transferred as heat at constant volume. According to the discussions we had in the preceding chapter, section 2.7, and the relationship delta free energy equals QV, heat transferred at constant volume, the energy transferred as heat, constant volume, is equal to the change in internal energy, not delta H. To convert from delta U to delta H, we need to note that the molar enthalpy of a substance is related to its molar internal energy, equation 2.13a. For condensed phases, actually before we move on, highlighting the relationship that we're looking at here, for condensed phases, Pressure times volume is so small it can be ignored. For example, the molar volume of liquid water is 18 cubic centimeters per mole. And 
the difference is negligible. However, molar volume of gas, and therefore the value of PV, is about 1,000 times greater and can't be ignored. For gases treated as perfect, PVM may be replaced by RT. Therefore, if in the chemical equation the difference is, the products minus the reactants and stoichiometric coefficients of gas phase species is delta V gas, we can write the following where the standard enthalpy of combustion is equal to the change in free energy plus the delta V gas RT. Noting that delta V gas, where V is nu, is a dimensionless quantity. Now, let's talk about the combination of reaction enthalpies. The reaction enthalpy, or the enthalpy of reaction, delta Rh, is the change in enthalpy that accompanies a chemical reaction. The enthalpy of a combustion is just a special case. The reaction enthalpy is the difference between the molar enthalpies of the reaction and the products, with each term weighted by the stoichiometric coefficient, V, in the final chemical equation, which we're taking a look at here with equation 3.4a. So we can see that delta Rh is the sum of quantities for the products minus the sum of quantities for the reactants. The standard reaction enthalpy, the standard enthalpy of reaction, is the value of the reaction enthalpy when all the reactants and products are in their standard states. And that's equation 3.4b. Because the HM are molar quantities and the stoichiometric coefficients are pure numbers, the units of delta RH under standard conditions are kilojoules per mole. The standard reaction enthalpy is the change in enthalpy of the system when the reactants of the standard states, meaning their pure compounds at one bar, are completely converted into products in their standard states, pure compounds at one bar, with the change expressed in kilojoules per mole of reactions as written. Thus, if for the reaction of two equivalents of hydrogen gas plus one equivalent of oxygen gas leads to the production of two equivalents of liquid water, we report that delta Rh equals negative 572 kilojoules per mole. Then the per mole means the reaction releases 572 kilojoules of heat per mole of oxygen consumed or per two moles water formed, and therefore 286 kilojoules per mole of water formed. It is often the case that a reaction enthalpy is needed, but is not available on data tables. Now, the fact that enthalpy as a state function comes in handy, because it implies that we can construct the required reaction enthalpy from the reaction enthalpies of known reactions. We've already seen a primitive example when we calculated the enthalpy of sublimation from the sum of enthalpies of fusion and vaporization. The only difference is that we now apply this technique to a sequence of chemical reactions. The procedure is summarized by Hess's law. And Hess's law states the following. The standard enthalpy of a reaction is the sum of the standard enthalpies of the reactions into which the overall reaction may be divided. And that can be divided any number of different ways because enthalpy is a state function. Although the procedure is given the status of a law, it hardly deserves the title because it's nothing more than a consequence of enthalpy being a state function, which implies that an overall enthalpy change can be expressed as a sum of enthalpy changes for each step of an indirect path. So in some sense, it's saying that you know one plus one equals two. Now, remember, that each step has to correspond to the same temperature for this to be valid. So let's take a look at an example of Hess's law. Given the thermochemical equations below, where you have an equivalent of C3H6 gas plus H2 gas, forming C3H8 gas with a standard enthalpy 
of negative 200, uh, excuse me, negative 124 kilojoules. And C3H8 gas, which is the product of the first reactant, reaction is now a reactant in the second, plus five oxygen can yield in combustion at three CO2 plus four liquid water with a delta H of negative 2,220 kilojoules where C3H6 is propane and C3H8 is propane, calculate the standard enthalpy of combustion of propane. Now this is an important distinction because there's a variety of compounds you could potentially make with those chemical formula. So it's nice that they let you know that it's propane and propane specifically. So the strategy for this, we need to add or subtract the thermochemical equations together with any others that are needed from the data section so as to reproduce the thermochemical equation for the reaction required. In calculations of this type, it's often necessary to use the synthesis of water to balance the hydrogen or oxygen atoms in the overall equation. Once again, it may be useful to express the changes diagrammatically, which we'll see in figure 3.6. So the solution for this looks like the following. The overall reaction, adding the two equations together, will give us propene plus nine halves of an equivalent of oxygen gas react to form in combustion three equivalents of carbon dioxide plus three equivalents of liquid water. We can recreate the thermochemical equation from the following. One, two, three equations, which we find in our standard tables, where we have propane plus hydrogen gives us propane. Propane being combusted in the presence of five oxygen gives us three CO2 plus four water in the liquid form. And one liquid water plus can be divided to form hydrogen gas plus one half of an oxygen. So overall, we get the balanced equation. And if you sum the component enthalpies, we find that the standard enthalpy of combustion is negative 2,058 kilojoules per mole. Now, what's this look like diagrammatically? If we look at figure 3.6, uh, we can see how Hess's law helps us solve this problem visually. Now let's take a break from problem solving and have a discussion about fuels, food, and energy reserves. Because we're having this discussion about combustion and the quality of fuels and the efficiency of fuels. But I want to relate this not just on physical chemistry principles, but to biological principles as well. So we'll see in chapter four that the best assessment of the ability of a compound to act as a fuel to drive many of the processes occurring in the body makes use of Gibbs free energy. However, a useful guide to the resources provided by a fuel, and the only one that matters when a heat output is considered, is enthalpy, particularly the enthalpy of combustion. The thermochemical properties of fuel and foods are commonly discussed in terms of specific enthalpy. The enthalpy of combustion divided by the mass of material, typically kilojoules per gram, or enthalpy density, the magnitude of the enthalpy combustion divided by the volume of material, typically in kilojoules per cubic decimeters. Thus, if the standard enthalpy of combustion and the molar mass of the compound is m, then the specific enthalpy is going to be determined by the change in specific enthalpy and standard conditions per mole. Similarly, enthalpy density will be uh, per unit volume. There's going to be a table following that lists the specific enthalpies and enthalpy densities of several fuels. The most suitable fuels are those with high specific enthalpies, meaning they have a substantial amount of energy per unit mole. As the advantage of a high molar enthalpy of combustion may be eliminated if a large mass of fuel has to be transported we see that 
hydrogen gas compares very well with many of the more traditional fuels such as methane or natural gas, isooctane, gasoline, and methanol. Furthermore, the combustion of H2 gas does not generate CO2 gas, pollutant, uh, implicated in global warming. As a result, H2 gas has been proposed as an efficient, clean alternative fossil fuel such as natural gas and petroleum. However, we also see that hydrogen gas has a very low enthalpy density, which arises from the fact hydrogen is a very light gas. So the advantage of a high specific enthalpy is undermined by the large volume of fuel that has to be transported or stored. Strategies are being developed to solve the storage problem. For example, small hydrogen molecules can travel through holes in the crystalline lattice of a sample of metal such as titanium where they bind as a metal hydride. In this way, it's possible to increase the effective density of hydrogen atoms to a value that's higher than that of liquid hydrogen gas, or excuse me, hydrogen liquid. Then the fuel can be released on demand by heating the metal. So we now assess the factors that optimize the heat output of a carbon-based fuel with an eye towards understanding such biological fuels, such as carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Let's consider the combustion of one mole of methane gas, the main constituent of natural gas. The reaction involves change in the oxidation number of carbon from minus 4 to plus 4 in oxidation and, an, and of oxygen from 0 to minus 2, a reduction. From the thermochemical equations, we see that 890 kilojoules of energy is released as heat per mole of carbon that is oxidized. Now consider the oxidation of one mole of methanol. The reaction is also exothermic, but instead of 890 kilojoules of energy, we now have only 764 kilojoules of energy released um, as the carbon goes, undergoes oxidation. Much of the observed change in energy output between the reaction begin explained by noting that the carbon in methanol has an oxidation number of minus 2 and not minus 4 as in methane. That is, the replacement of the carbon-hydrogen bond by carbon-oxygen bonds renders the carbon in methanol more oxidized than the carbon in methane. So it's reasonable to expect that less energy is released to complete the oxidation to CO2 in methanol. In general, we find the presence of partially oxidized carbon atoms, that is, carbon atoms bonded to oxygen atoms in the material makes it a less suitable fuel than a similar material containing more highly reduced carbon atoms, meaning carbons that are surrounded by single bonds typically bound to hydrogens. Another factor that determines heat output of combustion reaction is the number of carbons in a hydrocarbon compound. For example, from the value of the standard enthalpy of combustion of methane, we know that each mole of methane supplied to a furnace gives you 890 kilojoules of energy that can be released, whereas each mole of isooctane, C8H18, a typical component of gasoline supplied to an internal combustion engine, allows for 5,461 kilojoules of heat to be released. The much larger value for isooctane is a consequence of each molecule having eight carbon atoms to contribute to the formation of carbon dioxide, whereas methane has only one. Now we turn our attention to biological fuels, and this is the biological analog that I really wanted to lean on. The foods we ingest to meet our energy requirements in daily life. A typical 18 to 20 year old man requires daily output of about 12 megajoules. A woman of the same age needs about 9 megajoules, and these are broad generalizations. If the entire consumption were in the form of glucose, which has a specified enthalpy of 16 kilojoules per gram, meaning energy needs would require the consumption of 750 grams of glucose by the man and 560 grams by the woman. In fact, the complex carbohydrates, which are polymers of carbohydrate units such as starches, more commonly found in our diets, have high, slightly higher specific enthalpies than glucose itself. So a carbohydrate diet is slightly less daunting than a pure glucose diet, as well being more appropriate in the form of fiber indigestible cellulose that helps move digestive products through the intestine. The specific enthalpy of fats, which is a major difference we're about to discover, which are long-chain esters, like 
tristerin in beef fat is much greater than that of carbohydrates at about 38 kilojoules per gram, slightly less than the value of the hydrocarbon oils used for fuel. The reason for this lies in the fact that many of the carbon atoms and carbohydrates are bonded to oxygen atoms and are already partially oxidized. There is less potential energy in these compounds because of their already being partially oxidized. And the amount of energy we can abstract from the compound means the more reduced a carbon compound is before entering metabolism, since terminal metabolism ends with the formation of CO2, carbon is the most oxidized form, there's just inherently going to be more energy in lipids than carbohydrates. Fats are commonly used as energy storage to be used only when more readily accessible carbohydrates have fallen in short supply. In Arctic species, store fat also acts as a layer of insulation. In desert species, such as camel, fat also acts as a source of water because digesting fats can produce water, one of its oxidation products. Another reason this is important is because we were talking about energy density per unit volume. Storing carbohydrates takes substantially more volume and also typically accompanied by more water molecules biologically than the storage of fat. So you get not only more energy density per gram, but it requires less volume, allowing us to be smaller organisms to store the equivalent amount of energy. Proteins are also used as a source of energy, but their components, the amino acids, are often too valuable to squander this way and are used to construct other proteins instead. When proteins are oxidized to urea, the equivalent enthalpy density is comparable to that of carbohydrates because of their degree of oxidation. We've also already remarked that not all energy released by oxidation of foods is converted to work. The heat that is also released needs to be discarded in order to maintain body temperature within its typical range of 35.6 to 37.8 degrees Celsius. A variety of mechanisms contribute to this aspect of homeostasis, the ability of an organism to counteract environmental changes with physiological responses. The general uniformity of temperature throughout the body is maintained largely by the flow of blood. When heat needs to be dissipated rapidly, warm blood is allowed to flow through the capillaries to the skin, so producing flushing. Radiation is one of the means of discarding heat. Another is evaporation and the energy demands of the enthalpy of vaporization of water. Evaporation removes about 2.4 kilojoules per gram of water perspired. When vigorous exercise promotes sweating through the influence of heat selectors in the hypothalamus, one to two decimeters cubed of perspired water can be produced per hour, corresponding to a heat loss of 2.4 to 5 megajoules per hour. I also want to add to this discussion um, that adaptively, the mitochondria can decouple electron transport to become less inherently efficient at making ATP, but to produce more heat. Therefore, at the mitochondrial level, we have the ability to tune the amount of heat we are producing, which is why if you live in the Arctic, say in, uh, up above Fairbanks or near the interior of Alaska for any period of time, you've realized that after a spell of 50 below, you actually feel warm at 20 below with minimal clothes because your body has upregulated those decoupling proteins in mitochondrial processes. And even though you're making ATP less efficiently, your body is producing more heat. And then if you go from that kind of environment to say Hawaii, you can't stop sweating because your body is just producing enormous amounts of thermal energy that you're then trying to compensate for through uh, evaporative cooling. And eventually, if you live in that environment, your body will turn down those decoupling protein activities, you'll become more efficient at AP, ATP production and just generate less heat to maintain appropriate homeostasis. So we have a number of adaptive tools in terms of uh, thermochemical applications of biochemistry. That fun segue said, let's talk about standard enthalpies of formation. Now the problem with equation 
A and B, which we saw preceding the discussion of Hesse's law, is that we have no way of knowing the absolute enthalpies of the substances. To avoid this problem, we can imagine the reaction as taking place by an indirect route in which the reactants are first broken down into elements and then the products are formed from the elements. Specifically, the standard enthalpies of formation of a substance is the standard enthalpy per mole of the substance for its formation from its elements in the reference states. The reference state of an element is its most stable form under the prevailing conditions, which we'll see in Table 3.7 in a few slides. Don't confuse reference state with standard state. The reference state of carbon at 25 degrees Celsius is graphite. The standard state of carbon at any specific, uh, specified state of the element at one bar. For example, the standard enthalpy of formation of liquid water at 25 degrees Celsius is obtained from the thermochemical equation following hydrogen gas plus half an equivalent of oxygen gas leads to the formation of liquid water with a change in enthalpy of negative 286 kilojoules. And as the change of enthalpy formation, liquid water is negative 286 kilojoules per mole. Note that enthalpies of formation are molar quantities, so to go from delta H in a thermochemical equation to delta formation H for that substance, divide by the amount of substance formed, in this instance by one mole of water. With the introduction of standard enthalpies of formation, we can rewrite a new version of equation 3.4, now 3.5. The first term on the right is the enthalpy of formation of all of the products from their elements. The second term on the right is the enthalpy of formation of all of the reactants from their elements. The fact that the enthalpy is a state function means that a reaction enthalpy calculated in this way is identical to the value that would be calculated from equation 3.4 if absolute enthalpies were available. The values of some standard enthalpies of formation at 25 degrees Celsius are given on table 3.8, and a longer list is given in the data section. The standard enthalpies of formation of elements in their reference states are zero by definition, because their formation is the null reaction element to element. Note, however, that the standard enthalpy of formation of an element in a state other than its reference state is not zero. So, the transition from solid carbon in its graphite form to solid carbon in its diamond form has a delta H of plus 1.895 kilojoules. Therefore, although the standard enthalpy of formation of graphite carbon equals zero, the delta H formation for carbon in diamond form is plus 1.895 kilojoules per mole. The reference states of the element define a thermochemical sea level per se, and the enthalpies of formation can be regarded as thermochemical altitudes above or below sea level. Compounds that have negative standard enthalpies of formation, such as water, are classified as exothermic compounds. They lie at a lower enthalpy than the component elements. Compounds that have positive standard enthalpies of formation, such as carbon disulfide, are classified as endothermic compounds and possess a higher enthalpy than their component elements. This also gives you some indication of relative stabilities. So let's take a look at example 3.5 using standard enthalpies of formation. Calculate the standard enthalpy of form combustion of liquid benzene from the standard enthalpies of formation of the reactants and products. So the strategy for this is we write the chemical equation, identify stoichiometric numbers of reactants and products, then use equation 3.5. Note that the expression has the form products minus reactants. Numeric values of standard enthalpies of formation are given in data sections, which you can just reference through the text. The standard enthalpy of combustion is the enthalpy change per mole of substance, so we need to interpret enthalpy change accordingly.
So let's take a look at the process for obtaining the solution. The chemical equation is as follows. We have liquid benzene plus 15 halves of an equivalent of oxygen gas lead to the full combustion forming six carbon dioxides and three liquid waters. It follows the following. Where we have six equivalents of CO2, three equivalents of water in liquid form minus the initial state, which includes benzene and oxygen. And this gives us negative 3,268 kilojoules per mole for the combustion of a mole of benzene. Inspection of the chemical equation shows that in the systems per mole is per mole of benzene, which is exactly what we need for an enthalpy of combustion. It follows that the standard enthalpy of combustion of liquid benzene is minus 3,268 kilojoules per mole. And note on good practice, the standard enthalpy of formation of an element in its reference state, oxygen gas in this example, is written as zero, not zero kilojoules per mole, because it's zero whatever units we happen to be using. So this is table 3.8, which we referenced for a variety of compounds. And there's more extensive tables in the back of the book in the data section. So just a few more slides to go. To wrap up, let's talk about enthalpies of formation and molecular modeling. It's difficult to estimate standard enthalpies of formation of different conformations of molecules. For example, we obtain the same enthalpy of formation for the equatorial and axial conformations of methyl cyclohexane if we proceed as an example 3.3. However, it's been observed experimentally that molecules in these two conformations have very different enthalpies of formation as a result of greater steric repulsion when the methyl group is in the axial position than when it's in the equatorial position. Here we have our methyl in the axial position versus the equatorial position and all of these bulky groups are interacting with these protons, whereas in the equatorial position, there's no steric interaction uh, with the hydrogens on the cyclohexane ring. So computer-aided molecular modeling uses commercially available software. It's, it's now widely available and used to estimate standard enthalpies of formation of molecules with complex three-dimensional structures and can distinguish between different conformations of the same molecule. In the case of cyclohexane, for example, the calculated difference in enthalpy of formation ranges from 5.9 to 7.9 kilojoules per mole, which compares favorably with the experimental value of 7.5 kilojoules per mole. However, good agreement between calculated and experimental values is relatively rare. Computational methods almost always predict correctly which conformation of a molecule is most stable, but do not always predict the correct numeric values of the difference in enthalpies of formation. So they're great for determining relative stability, but not accurately predicting terms which accurately agree with experimental values per se. The variation of reaction enthalpy with temperature. We've been leaning away from this a little bit and talking about conventional temperatures uh, of phase changes as well as conventional temperatures just being 25 degrees Celsius. However, it often happens that we have data at one temperature but need it at another temperature. For example, we might want to know the enthalpy of a particular reaction at body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius, but may have data available only for 25 degrees Celsius. Another type of question that could arise might be whether the oxidation of glucose is more exothermic when it takes place inside an arctic fish that inhabits water at zero degrees Celsius than when it takes place in a mammalian body temperature. Similarly, we may need to predict whether the synthesis of ammonia is more exothermic at a typical industrial temperature of 450 degrees Celsius than 25 degrees Celsius. In precise work, every attempt would be made to measure the reaction enthalpy at the temperature of interest. But it's useful to have a back of the envelope way of estimating the direction uh, 
of change, and even if a moderate reliable numeric value is available. So in figure 3.9, we're going to see this illustration of a technique we use. As we have seen, the enthalpy of a substance increases with temperature. Therefore, the total enthalpy of the reactants and the total enthalpy of the products increase as shown in the illustration. Provided the two total enthalpies increase are different, the standard reaction enthalpy, their difference at a given temperature, will change as the temperature is changed. The change in enthalpy of a substance depends on the slope of the graph and therefore on the constant pressure heat capacities of the substances. We can therefore expect the temperature dependence of the reaction enthalpy to be related to the difference in heat capacities of the products and the reactants. And that's what we're seeing with figure 3.9. The enthalpy of the substance increases with temperature. Therefore, if total enthalpy of the reactants increase by different amounts from that of the products, the reaction enthalpy will change with temperature. The change in reaction enthalpies depends on relative slopes, which is determined by the heat capacities of the substances, specifically the delta in heat capacities between the reactants and the products. As a simple example, let's consider the following reaction. We have two units of hydrogen gas plus one unit of oxygen gas lead to the formation of two equivalents of liquid water, where the standard enthalpy of reaction is known as known at one temperature, for example, 25 degrees Celsius from the tables that we have in the text. According to equation 3.5, we can write the following, where delta H equals the components delta, uh, enthalpies for liquid water minus the component enthalpies for hydrogen gas plus oxygen gas. For the reaction at temperature T, specifically, if the reaction takes place at a higher temperature, T prime, the molar enthalpy of each substance is increased because it stores more energy and the standard reaction enthalpy becomes the following with these new terms for the new temperature, where the prime signify the values at the new temperature. Equation 216 where the heat capacity equals delta H over delta T or approximately the amount of heat required to change a sample a uh, per unit temperature implies that the increase in molar enthalpy of a substance when the temperature is changed from T to T prime is CPM times T prime minus T where CPM is the standard molar constant pressure heat capacity of the substance the molar heat capacity measured at one bar. For example, the molar enthalpy of water changes to the following if the heat capacity of water constant pressure um, is constant over the temperature range. When we substitute terms like this into the expression above, we find the following, where we can evaluate the change in heat capacity equals a term for heat capacity for water, our product, minus the sum of heat capacities for our reactants. Note that this combination has the same pattern as the reaction enthalpy and the stoichiometric numbers occur in the same way. In general, the change in heat capacity is the difference between the weighted sums of the standard molar heat capacities of the products and the reactants, which is a nice way to visualize the process. So this relationship is referred to as Kirchhoff's law. We see that just as we anticipated, the standard reaction enthalpy at one temperature can be calculated from the standard reaction enthalpies at other temperatures, provided we know the standard molar constant pressure heat capacities of all substances. These values are given in the data section.
The derivation of Kirchhoff's law supposes that the heat capacities are constant over ranges of temperatures of interest which is a limitation. So the law is best restricted to small temperature differences of no more than 100 Kelvin or so. So let's take a look at an, one example of applying Kirchhoff's law, and that is going to be it for chapter 3. So the standard enthalpy formation of gaseous water at 25 degrees Celsius is negative, 241.82 kilojoules per mole. Estimate its value at 100 degrees Celsius. So first, as part of our strategy, we need to write the chemical equation and identify the stoichiometric numbers, then calculate the values of delta heat capacity under standard conditions from the data section by using equation 3.7 and use the results in equation 3.6. This is what our solution looks like. The chemical equation is Hydrogen plus half an equivalent of oxygen will give you water. And the molar constant pressure heat capacities of water, hydrogen, and oxygen are 33.58, 28.84, and 29.37 joules per Kelvin mole, respectively. It follows that when we substitute, we can put these terms neatly into our equation. Let me make a little check here, giving us the following. Then, because T prime minus T is 75 Kelvin, from equation 3.6 we can find that delta H for this particular prime temperature of 100 degrees Celsius is going to be negative 242.57 kilojoules per mole. It turns out the experimental value for this process at 100 degrees Celsius is 242.58 kilojoules per mole, so incredibly close. The calculations in this example show the standard reaction enthalpy at 100 degrees Celsius is only slightly different than that of 25 degrees Celsius. And the reason is the change in reaction enthalpy is proportional to the difference between the molar heat capacities of the products and reactants, which is usually not that large. It's generally the case that Provided the temperature range is not too wide, enthalpies of reactions vary only slightly with temperature. A reasonable first approximation is that standard reaction enthalpies are independent of temperature. When the temperature range is too wide for it to be safe to assume the heat capacities are constant, the empirical temperature dependence of each heat capacity given in equation 3.6 may be used. The resulting expression is best developed through mathematical software because it gets pretty complicated. So in application, it's not as much about solving for these differences as being aware is how processes deviate from known conditions as temperatures increase or decrease, and what factors drive those variations. And that is it for chapter three. So next up, we get into chapter four. Um, but first off, I'll be sending out a homework assignment to get you guys working through some of these concepts. And I'll be talking to you later.